Thanks for being here with me. I uh, was just saying with Ian Lee there that we don't know yet exactly uh, the course the next few months in U.S. politics are going to take, but they're going to be interesting. Um, there may be a few more curveballs and bumps along the way than we would normally expect, but here we go. Uh, all we can do, though, is, uh, is plan for the most likely outcome, and the most likely outcome is that we will have uh, President uh, Joseph R. Biden Jr. sworn in in January of next year. I want to bring on uh, Tatiana Bolton, uh, Managing Senior Fellow for the R Street Institute's National and Cybersecurity Team. Uh, Tatiana, great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Um, we There's so many angles we can talk about just the next couple of months of, of what's ahead in the U.S. But let's actually uh, raise our gaze ab- above that and, and look beyond uh, the first day of of a Biden presidency. I don't know if most people fully appreciate the importance of cybersecurity. I just don't mean for for individuals, but I mean for nation states. Hacking someone's networks, disrupting their financial systems, their government processes, even possibly going after critical infrastructure is a very low cost but high impact way for countries to raise hell with their much larger and more powerful adversaries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, So basically, we've seen uh, attacks on our critical infrastructure, like you said, including uh, healthcare systems recently, people going after the vaccine. And these are attacks done sometimes by people who are trying to get a ransom, trying to get a lot of money. But excuse me. But sometimes it's nation states. We have advanced persistent threat actors. Uh, we call them APTs, and that includes China and Iran and Russia, who are trying to either attack our elections, which you've seen. They um, they get onto our electrical grid, uh, and sometimes they try to steal the plans for uh, the Defense Department's acquisition projects, like fighter jets or. Uh, military hardware. And you can obviously see how that can end up. Um, It's a serious national security threat. When we look at the last four years in the United States, and I do not intend this at all as as a partisan comment, this is not looking for any sort of analysis of Donald Trump, but I'm just wondering, over the last four years, what uh, what has been the progress, if any, in hardening U.S. Uh, cybersecurity? Is this something the Trump administration uh, puts necessary attention to? Well, so I will say that there are great people within the United States government, including Chris Krebs and the team at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, where uh, where I worked for the last uh, uh, three years, and the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. All of these efforts have been in an attempt to create a better strategy for United States cybersecurity. That was the goal of the United States uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And there's been incremental change so far. Part of the problem is that we have a very complicated process on the Hill, which uh, the commission recommended that we uh, streamline by creating uh, select committees on cybersecurity on the House and on the Senate. Uh, And we recommended that we create a national cyber director because in the last four years, uh, uh, President Trump has decided to remove that position and it created a power vacuum in the White House where people were not – uh, where cybersecurity was not elevated to the level that which it should be, given the prominence of cyber attacks that we've, we've been seeing. Uh, and so there have been limited steps. Uh, but I would say that, you know, even the executive orders that have happened on America's workforce and cybersecurity and protecting our elections and protecting our critical infrastructure, it's not enough. Cybersecurity needs more resources and it needs a more prominent voice. That's why I'm such a big proponent of uh, creating the National Cyber Director, which hopefully should happen within the next uh, year. What would be the early priorities for such a director? So uh, the director would be the president's principal advisor on cybersecurity. That person would be sitting at the table with the national security advisor, with the president, with other principals in the government, and he would provide them advice on what to do and elevate cybersecurity to the level where it needs to be. 
the national security advisor, you know, has a very difficult job. When he gets up in the morning or she gets up in the morning, they're not uh, considering cybersecurity as their top priority. I doubt it cracks the top 10 because you're dealing with issues like China and, you know, what ha- you know, Russia flying MiGs over, you know, over uh, near Alaska. It's, it's, it's a problem. And so we need someone to do that. We need someone to look over budgets. Uh, so the National Cyber Director would have a view uh, and uh, perhaps some certification authority over the budgets of different agencies, because right now they're not well coordinated. And like the Department of Energy and the Department of Treasury, they all do their own thing. They've got their they build their own sensors. They build their own um, they build their own networks in order to gather information. And none of that is being centralized right now. And therefore, it can't be aggregated and analyzed collectively for the United States as a problem we saw in 9-11, for example, where the intelligence community wasn't coordinated, and we'd hate to see the same thing happen in cyber. Well, we, we sure would, and I would say um, you know, hopefully we don't have some cyber 9-11 coming down uh, the, the rails towards us. I mean, it's 2020, so I wouldn't rule anything out, I guess, but one of the things <laughs> um, that, that we, we are certainly more aware of is, well, I would say there's two there's two f- separate forces, but they're converging in a way where it ends up not being to our advantage. One of them is that there are more and more hostile actors out there who are developing their cyber warfare capabilities or further enhancing their existing ones. So that's bad. While that is happening, we, and I don't mean the United States specifically, I'll just speak of the Western world generally here, we are increasingly reliant on this stuff. I, I wrote a, co- a column a couple of years ago where I was uh, making fun of myself a little bit. I, I was up at uh, a country house we have in our family a couple of hours outside uh, Toronto, Titania, and the modem broke, and I, for three days I didn't have the internet, and it was like the world ended. Like My kids were in full revolt. I couldn't get anything done. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my work ground to a halt. And I was thinking to myself, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't even have the internet here because we were like, well, why would you put the internet in the country? house that's where you go to to relax we are so dependent on this stuff more and more so not just for convenience but for security for life and for limb and there's a lot more people out there who are getting ever better at disrupting it absolutely i mean you know you can just look at what's happened with the pandemic to see how critical our infrastructure is especially the um the network that we rely on to provide us internet in our homes and to secure our bank accounts so we can bank remotely so that we don't actually have to go into uh, any go uh to the bank or an ATM to deposit a check or to uh, check the, uh, the balance on our accounts. But you can also see it with, um, you know, with the healthcare system attacks uh, in, the recent, uh, in the recent months. When you've got uh, people who will do anything uh, for a buck, you've got uh, people who will attack not only the electrical grid, but they'll attack your uh, health care records to, uh, to try and uh, slow down down uh, health care uh, just to get money and slows down the health care system. But it also puts people's lives in jeopardy when they're uh, reliant on electronic medical records to determine what m- prescription or medication to give you. And if you're, you know, um, if you're at risk, that's a big problem. They've also attacked, uh, people have attacked and tried to get into uh, the biopharmaceutical companies' research uh, on vaccines. Um, you know, all of this is, is critically important and just it, it, it needs to be elevated. Um, that's sort of my main goal here. And one of the interesting things is that you've mentioned critical infrastructure. It is getting to the point where if you went after a power grid or, as you said, a, a healthcare system, we know the, the British uh, NHS has been attacked. Uh, there have been smaller attacks on individual hospitals. You can start doing damage in line with more traditional acts of war that might not even be attributable. Imagine losing your power grid and you don't even know for sure who it is who turned it off. Exactly. Uh, there's an issue uh, in cybersecurity with the speed in which things happen and the destruction that it can cause. Uh, we saw this with the Stuxnet attack um, that uh, was attributed uh, by some to the United States uh, that turned off the Iranian nuclear reactors. So, you know, once we're getting close to uh, uh, once we're getting close to power plants and nuclear reactors and um, you know and our electrical grid. Um, 
it can be dangerous. And in fact, last year, we saw the first death uh, that was attributed to a cyber attack. Uh, so it's um, it's it's definitely difficult. And, you know, you don't want to uh, you don't want to put people's lives in, in danger. So we need to create a resilient system. We need to create a stronger system where the um, where the entire world works together to protect our networks while while maintaining the free and open society and Internet that we uh, we expect and believe in. You mentioned 9-11, and I've got one more very, very cheerful, uh, optimistic, and, and, and morning-brightening question for you here. We didn't take a lot of things seriously until we all woke up and saw New York in flames. Are we going to have to do the same thing with, with cybersecurity? Like, are we going to have to spend four days with no power before we realize maybe we should hire some smart coders here? Like, is there any sense that we're taking cybersecurity seriously now before we ought to be, as opposed to just meandering into another disaster and then wondering how it happened? Well, I really hope not, but I'm an eternal optimist. Um, but having worked last uh, year and a half with the uh, the United States uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission, that's exactly what we were trying to prevent. We created a, an, a whole of nation national security cybersecurity strategy, and uh, we we touched on all of the different areas, including um, strengthening our, our military response and and being ready with defense forward actions in cybersecurity, which means that you know we don't wait for an attack. We want to be proactive and uh, make sure that we understand what's going out what's going on out there, and we've. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, recommendations in our report, 84, in fact, uh, that try to make, t- try to provide actionable steps the United States government can take right now, and some of our partners and allies as well, in order to uh, make our country stronger, make the na- make the whole world stronger in terms of uh, resilient and uh, more protected systems, so that we don't have to face a 9/11 and cybersecurity. Which, to be fair, I don't really like that phrase, but it's. It's not something we want to see, obviously. And so we're doing everything we can. And, uh, for example, we did manage to get several of our recommendations into the National Defense Authorization Act this year, uh, and we hope to see those uh, enacted uh, in December. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, We'll stay in touch. Let me know what ends up happening. And uh, I just want to thank uh, you for coming on. I want to thank all the listeners and also all the national security agencies who are listening in on our conversation. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for this to Tanya. We really appreciate thank your time you. this morning. Tanya Bolton. Oh, my pleasure. You too. Uh, Tanya Bolton of the R Street Institute, my guest here on the show.